Morning, everyone. We're going to get started. If everybody could just trickle in and take their seats, that would be much appreciated. I'm Alvin. For those of you that don't know me, I'm one of the chief residents, and I have the honor today of introducing our very esteemed guest speaker, Ms. Uh, Dr. Roseanne M. Leipzig, MD, PhD, is the Gerald and Mary Ellen Ritter Professor and the Vice Chair Emerita of the Brookdale Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Leipzig served as the department's Vice Chair for education of 25 years. Dr. Leipzig is an internationally recognized leader in geriatrics. She has received numerous awards for her work, including the American College of Physicians, Richard and Hinda Rosenthal Foundation Award, a Joy McCannon Scholar Award recognizing her expertise in mentoring and medical education, the 2008 Denise W. Janigan Memorial Award for the American Geriatric Society, a Brookdale National Fellowship in Geriatric Medicine, and in 2014 received the Paula Edelbrick Community Service Award for services and advocacy for GLBT elders. In 2016, she received the Jacoby Medallion, one of the highest honors from the Mount Sinai Health System. She is also the editor-in-chief of a monthly newsletter for consumers and past chair of the Geriatrics Working Group of the United States Preventative Services Task Force and the American Board of Internal Medicine's Subspecialty Board on Geriatric Medicine. She has published over 100 articles and was the deputy editor for the fourth edition of Cassell's Geriatric Medicine. Dr. Leipzig's new book, Honest Aging, An Insider's Guide to the Second Half of Life, describes what to expect physically, psychologically, functionally, and emotionally as you age, what you can do to adapt to your new normal, and how to have an enjoyable, engaging, and meaningful old age. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Leipzig. Thank you, Elvin. Can you all hear me? Okay, thank you. So it's really nice to be here. It's really nice to be in person, okay? <laughs> I have done, um, I can't tell you how many Zooms um, where, or webinars, where you're saying all this stuff and you're getting excited and you have no idea how it's landing, okay? <laughs> so it's really great to be here and it's also great to have the new residents, fellows, faculty uh, be a part. So I'm speaking on Honest Aging, which is the title of my new book, but I'm talking to you about being a better doctor for older adults. And when I talk about my uh, disclosures, it's the book that I'm talking about. Um, I do get royalties for it. It's not gonna make me a rich woman, but I do get, <laughs> get royalties. And I'm talking about this because when Dr. Thomas said to me, I want you to do grand rounds, I said, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, your new book. And I said, well, isn't that a conflict of interest? <laughs> so I decided what I would do is talk to you about an approach to caring for older adults. And every once in a while, slip in some of the things that are in the book as well, okay? So this is the book. I will never look that good again, okay? <laughs> when I started to write this book and thought about writing this book, it came because I have cared for, I don't know how many thousands of patients during my 40 years of practice and families and loved ones. And every time I go to anything, a cocktail party, I'm sitting on the, you know, in the airport, somebody sits next to me and says, what do you do? And I say, I'm a geriatrician. I get bombarded with questions. Is this normal? I have this, is this normal? What's not normal? What can I do about this? So I went to find a book that would, they could use, and I couldn't find one. But what I found and got me thinking was this, which many of you know, right? <laughs> what to expect when you're expecting that was written by Arlene Eisenberg and her daughters, and is now in the I don't know how many edition. And I thought, that's the book I want to write, but for aging, okay? <laughs> so the objectives of today's talk are three. The first is that when you leave, you will realize that how a person reacts to aging determines what their old age will be like. That perspective is really, really important. The second 
is that 80 year olds and 60 year olds differ from each other. Now, I'm not gonna say that the numbers are specific, it's not 79 versus 61, but in general, as you get older, there are physiologic, pathophysiologic, sociologic things that occur that make you different than younger people. And lastly, I hope that when you leave, you, when you start to think about your care plans for older adults, you will start thinking about their biologic age, I apologize, age-related changes that we will talk about right now. Calling emergency services. I did not mean to do <laughs> That is not what I meant to do. Whoops. <laughs> How do I get out of here? OK. <laughs> I think we need to turn this off. <laughs> Sorry. OK. And the geriatric 5Ms, which is in geriatrics, our new way of thinking about what's really important to somebody who is older. And it's what matters to them, their mentation, mobility, what we do to them with medications and multi-complexity. And I'll talk a little more about that in a little while, all right? So that's what I'm hoping that we will achieve. I wanna start by giving the big picture about how our society perceives growing old. And I have a friend who some of you may know, Greg Henriksen, he's a clinical psychologist who works with us. And he turned me on to birthday cards, okay? And how they represent our culture. And this is one of his, it's a nice birthday card, two older people sitting on a park bench. It's your birthday, so how do you feel? I feel like a newborn baby. Really? Yep, no hair, no teeth, and I think I just wet myself. <laughs> Happy birthday. Nice message, right? And for those of you who have seen Grace and Frankie and Jane Fonda. I don't want the world to know I'm as old as I am. Why, 80 is amazing. If you were a tortoise, you'd still be a teenager. Yeah, but if you're a person at that number, everybody looks at you like you have no future. Well, they just write you off. Or they want you to act your age. Which can be the worst thing, <laughs> okay? So this is ageism. It's another of the, age, of the isms that we have been talking about so much over the last several years. This word was actually coined by Bob Butler who was the chair, founding chair of the Department of Geriatrics here and the first um, chief of director of the National Institute on Aging. And ageism, just like racism, sexism, comes in several different flavors. One is systemic, which we just saw in the birthday card and on TV. And the other is internalized. It's what we think aging is gonna be like. And that has real consequences. It's bad for your patients when they are, have internalized negative views of aging because it turns into self-fulfilling prophecies. There's a woman who's a clinical psychologist up at Yale, has done a lifetime's worth of work. Her name is Becky Levy, and she has a book called Breaking the Age Code. And she has, I'll just tell you about two of her studies. In one, she showed that people who have a positive attitude toward aging in general live about seven and a half years longer and better than people who have a negative view. Second thing she did is she took older adults, had them sit in front of computers and they were gonna do some tasks. She randomized them. One group she sent subliminal images that were negative of aging. And the other group she sent subliminal images that were positive of aging. And then she had them do what I've always considered to be objective tests of hearing and of memory. And their ability to do memory tests and hearing tests was worse if they had gotten the negative images right before they did the test. So what you think you can do really influences what you even try to do. And it's bad for you as well because you're prejudiced against your future selves. If you are lucky, you will be old someday and you will take these feelings that you have right now and go with them into old age and they will influence it. So my perceptions of aging started with my grandmother right here. This is my cousin, Bonnie. Um, I use this to show the difference between old and young, okay? 
My grandmother had colon cancer and she had a colostomy and this is in the 50s. And colostomy bags were not so good in the 50s. So she came and she lived with us when I was about three. And she lived with us for about nine years. And despite her physical limitations, she lived a vibrant life. She went out, she went to, with her friends, she volunteered, she made us holla every Friday. She was an amazing woman. And if I had asked her about what it was like to grow old, she would have said, you're only as old as you let yourself be. It's a great way to think about aging, okay? So what is old age? We all have our own perceptions and beliefs. This is Bernard Baruch, who was a great statesman. To me, old age is always 15 years older than I am. And I have to say in my life, that's been kind of true. When I was in my 30s and I was doing a fellowship, my program director had a 50th birthday party. And I was like, oh my God, he's that old? <laughs> now I'm 72. When somebody has a 50th birthday party, I go, how can they be that young? <laughs> okay, it's really a perception that you have over time. So how do you feel about growing old? My grandmother was kind of a wise old owl. She wanted to know everything she could and then do what she could to make her life as enjoyable, engaged, and meaningful as possible. But there are a lot of people who are scared about old age and are worried about it. And then there's the vast majority of people who don't want to think about it at all. Head in the sand, okay? So what is it that we're afraid of with growing old? Well, when you ask, most people will say death. And very honestly, that's not the thing most older people are concerned with. Younger people, without a doubt. <laughs> but older people come to realize, you know, we've got an expiration date. It's going to come. We don't know quite when. But it's certainly closer now than it was when I was the age of most of you in this room. But we do fear physical and mental deterioration, which you see a lot of in the hospital. We fear being alone, being a burden, a term that I've come to really appreciate, diminishing relevance, where you don't, um, people don't pay as much attention to you as they used to. And you feel yourself, you feel diminished. And the uncertainty, and of course, life is filled with uncertainties. But the older you are, the more uncertainties there are. So what's reality? Let's just spend a couple of minutes going through that, some reality checks. How long are people likely to live and what shape are they likely to be in? Median life expectancy is a term that is different for every age. And what it is, is that for a given age, the age to which 50% of people will live beyond and 50% of people will die before, okay? So you have a median life expectancy when you're born, you have one at age 20, and you have one at age 65. So what do you think median life expectancy is for a 65-year-old in this country? Just scream it out, it's okay. 75, 80-something. 73, 80. All right, you guys got to get out more, OK? <laughs> All you're seeing are the sickest of the sick in the hospital. <laughs> Take a walk on the streets of New York. Look at the people around, OK? It's almost 85. That means you have about 20 years, OK, after usual retirement. And some people have 40 years. It's a pretty amazing time, and it's the first time ever that we've had that. How about if you make it to 85? Well, if you make it to 85, it's almost 92. And men, this is where your life expectancy becomes close to what women's is. Okay, before that, the women were winning. Mm -hmm. And how about 100? Is it 100 and a day? <laughs> no, it's 102.3. So the older you are, the older you will be, <laughs> okay? So you're going to live into old age. What is life going to be like? And these are reality checks for people who are over 85. That's the fastest growing group. Maybe over 100 is going to be the fastest growing group soon. So what percentage of people who are 85 and older say that their health is good or excellent? Now, many of us who do research have used this as a question where we say, is it fair, poor, 
poor, fair, good, or excellent. And what we find is if somebody tells you that their health is fair or poor, it is. And if they tell you that it's good or excellent, usually it is. So what percentage do you think, just scream it out, over 85, my health is good or excellent? 30? 60? 50? 70%, okay? Yeah. And I can do this for all of the following. What percent are living with dementia? 28%. And this is a lower percent than we've ever seen, and that's because brain health is heart health. And as we have done good things with cardiology, we've done good things for the brain. The problem here, of course, is that the number of older people is going up, 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 up as we baby boomers go up. So the number of people who actually are living with dementia will be increasing, even though the percentage has gone down. What percent have significant limitations in their vision, hearing, mobility, communication, cognition, or self-care? One of these. About half. And for those who are 65 and older, it's about 20%. What percent are frail? And I will be talking to you a lot more about frailty in a little bit. Only a quarter, okay? How many, what percent live alone? 27%. And men, this is where you win because you're much more likely to remarry, okay? <laughs> and not be living alone. Living in nursing homes? It's only 15%. And feel that they are a burden, and this is just from one study, okay? but it was 10%. So do those numbers jive with what you had in your mind before we went through this? For most people, no. To sum it up, most of us are gonna live into old age and we're gonna be in pretty good shape, okay? So think positively about this. So let's talk about who you will be or who anybody would be in old age. And I'm gonna tell you about three of my patients who are all 85. This is Rose, this is Isaiah, and this is Nancy, okay? Rose, these are pictures I obviously got from the internet, but, <laughs> but she really does look like this, okay? <laughs> she considers her health excellent, and it is. She developed new hypertension, and she got really upset because she'd never had any problems. And I said to her, you know, 90% of 90-year-olds have systolic hypertension. And she said, oh, it's normal. Great. And I said, yeah, it's normal, but you still need to be treated. And she said, why? If it's normal, it's what happens to everybody. And I said, well, you know, when I was in training, we did not treat people with high systolic blood pressure. We were afraid we were going to cause a stroke. And then the studies were done. The RCTs were done. And they found that you decrease the risk of stroke and of heart failure by about a third. So you need a pill. And she takes her pill. She has a great chance of making it to 100 she has eight great grandchildren. She wants to be around as long as possible. This is Isaiah, also 85, but not as lucky. He got diabetes. He's had it for 40 years and now he has low vision. He has a lot of trouble seeing. He also has COPD. And now he got rheumatoid arthritis on top of all of this. And he's, he's concerned. He's in pain. He's got difficulty using his hands and he loves using his hands. Um, and he's depressed and he's scared about what the future is gonna bring. And then there's Nancy. Nancy has mild Alzheimer's, also 85, COPD. She lives alone. She's recently lost 10 pounds. Her clothes are getting kind of big on her. She has more difficulty walking. You can see she's already using a cane. She's afraid of falling. She's short of breath when she's walking. And she's unsure what medication she's taking, which makes me nervous. So here they are, all the same chronologic age. And in geriatrics, we use the term heterogeneity of aging. And basically it means you've seen one 80 year old, you've seen one 80 year old, okay? As opposed, older adults are more variable one from the other than any other age group, okay? But what about biologic age? What is biologic age? Well, biologic age is a relationship between your current health state and how near you are to a worsening health state or to death. We don't have a way to 
put this into an algorithm and say, although some people think they can, <laughs> and say, you know, you're actually 78 years old, you're actually 82 years old, okay, you're actually 105. Um, <laughs> we don't have that, but people are working on it. And at this point, the estimations have two, two forms. The first form is clinical features, and I'll go through that with you, looking at frailty. And the second are biomarkers, where people are looking at things like CRP, creatinine, hemoglobin A1C, systolic blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera, and trying to put them together and see how good these are at giving us a sense of how near somebody is to serious illness or death. There's also a term which I just learned about, and I just want to share it with you because I find it very meaningful. The term is weathering, and this is a book that just came out by Arlene Geronimus, The Extraordinary Stress of Ordinary Life in an Unjust Society. And she talks about how weathering appears to accelerate biological aging. It's the growing disparity in physiologic functioning due to continual exposure to adverse conditions. And we look at that now with the social determinants of health to some degree, but we don't look at the stress of being exposed to a racist society, to having to deal with neighborhoods that are unsafe, things like that. And she calls this weathering. It accumulates over the lifespan and she believes it contributes to premature health deterioration. So this is a slide that appeared in a, BM, a Lancet article in 2022, looking at US life expectancy over 20 years from the year 2000 to 2019, right before COVID when everything changed, okay? And what we're looking at here in the middle, in the black triangles, are the numbers that I gave you at the beginning for median life expectancy in this country. But when we start to break it out by race ethnicity, we see some real differences. We see that white adults tend to be very close to the, median, the mean. Um, Latino and Asian or Pacific Islanders have a greater life expectancy. And during these, these are people who self-identified and we don't have reasons for it, we just have the data. Um, and over this 20 years, their life expectancy increased American Indians and Alaska Natives had a very low life expectancy and it didn't budge for 20 years. And black Americans had a, even had the lowest life expectancy in 2000. It increased over the next 20 years, but they're still not where white Americans were 20 years ago. So we have a lot of work to do. And I think to me, this, the concept of weathering may have something to do with the lack of longevity in some of these groups. So here we are back at our three patients and we're talking about biologic age. The take home message is that individuals of the same age differ in their vulnerability to adverse health outcomes. And we, when we see patients, when we want to prescribe a medication, suggest a surgery, we need to think about that. They are not all the same or as likely to have bad outcomes. So one way of doing this, that some people are using, is to say somebody like Rose is fit. She's in pretty good shape. She's 80 there's, or 85 and all the things that go along with being 85, but she's pretty resilient and she's doing pretty well. On the other hand, Nancy's frail and we'll talk about frailty in a minute. And Isaiah is vulnerable, he's in the middle. But the studies we've seen are that people who are vulnerable do most of the time when they're vulnerable, almost as badly as frail people do with the um, interventions that we do. So let's start with fit. What do we mean by fit? So I don't know how many of you have seen the Rose Chast book, Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant? It's a cartoon book. She's a uh, cartoonist from the New Yorker. She's marvelous. Um, so what does fit mean? Spry, totally independent, just like a normal adult, but with silver hair, okay? <laughs> People are trying to get us to believe 80 is the new 60, and it isn't. So what happens with normal age? You're gonna walk more slowly. Our comics make a lot of fun of our older Congress people, et cetera, because they walk more slowly. But that's a part of aging. Your gait speed decreases, and there are lots of reasons for it. 
there is a change in the distribution of fat in your body. So you get flabby arms and you get a pot belly. And every year I get a couple of patients in, I just had one last week, saying, I'm doing fine, but my belly's getting bigger. What do I do? <laughs> What's going on here? And I said, no, it's not a tumor. This is, you know, after examining her, of course. You have senior moments. The medical phrase for this is tip of the tongue phenomenon, okay? It's a problem with recall, not storage. You've got the information there, but you just can't get it out, okay? It's not dementia. They have more adverse reactions to medications. Study after study, the more medications a patient is taking, the more adverse reactions they're likely to have. So it's really, really important to be sure that the medications they're taking are ones they need to be taking, that they are at a dose that is appropriate because pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics change as you get older, and you get more bang for the buck. Just like older people are cheaper drunks, you should pardon the expression, but it takes less alcohol for them to feel what people like to feel with alcohol. It's the same thing with medications. Oftentimes, they need much less of a medication, and that can be a medication they've been taking for a long time. That can be insulin. That can be thyroid medication. They urinate more during the night. They don't need a prostate to have this problem, okay? It's an ADH problem. This is really important this year and with climate change. They are less thirsty when dehydrated. Years ago at the Boise VA, they did a study where they took young vets and old vets and they uh, water deprived them and they put water near them and they waited to see at what point people got thirsty and started going for the water. And young folks much earlier than older folks. So people don't recognize that they're getting dehydrated. And I tell my patients, you may not feel it, but if you're gonna go out in this, you better have that thing of water and be using it, okay? Certain diseases present differently. And we tend to call these atypical presentations of disease. But for older people, they're the typical presentation of disease. So 50% of people who are 80 and over who are having a heart attack are not gonna tell you they have chest pain or pressure. They're gonna have shortness of breath, they may have syncope, they may have confusion, okay? So you need to think about it. And lastly, yes, older people are still having sex, okay? Fewer than younger people, but they're still having sex, but it's less spontaneous, okay? People need stronger stimulation than they had, um, and they need to sometimes have things around to help with joints that ache and things like that. So those are things that are quote unquote normal. What's not normal, but really common? So back to Roz Chast, I could see that they were, just talking about her parents, they were slowly leaving the sphere of TV commercial old age. And moving into that part of old age that was scarier, harder to talk about, and not a part of this culture. And what she's really talking about here is what we call geriatric syndromes. Okay, so these are the geriatric syndromes. They have to do with falls, gait and balance, cognitive impairment, weight loss and malnutrition, impairment in vision and hearing, incontinence of urine and bowel at times, mood disorders, people saying they just don't have the energy they used to have, arthritis and pain, sleep problems, and frailty, there's that word again, and we'll get into it in a moment. So what's different about this from a medical condition? These are multifactorial. There are lots of reasons for these things to happen. And the good news is the more of these things that you're able to tweak, the better the person's gonna do. So the take home message is don't come to premature closure when you're trying to figure out what's going on and what's causing this. Think about all the things that you might be able to make better. So for example, if I told this guy to exercise, he would be making his gait and his gait better, he'd be less likely to fall, his cognition better, his mood better, his energy better. He would sleep better. He would be less frail, I'll show you that in a moment. He, if he does the right exercises, would be less likely to be incontinent. And again, the right exercises could help him with the arthritis and pain. One intervention, amazing. And that's why we say the only anti-aging medication we have is exercise. 
This comes from my book. I have this for all of the geriatric syndromes. And it's basically a worksheet for patients to use, to fill out before they come see you, that goes through all of these different factors so that you know which ones are concerning to them. So let's get to frailty. What is frailty? Well, I would bet that I am one of the few people in this room who remembers Justice Potter Stewart. He was a Supreme Court justice. But he was asked to define obscenity. And he said, can't define it, but I know it when I see it. OK? And that's what many people feel about frailty, because we expect frail people to be these shriveled little people like this. But we live in the age of obesity, right? And there are a lot of obese people who are um, frail. And part of that is because the fat infiltrates the muscles and makes them frail. So what is frailty? It's a loss of the physiologic reserve you need to deal with stresses like illness and trauma. And for those of you who are visual learners, this is a cartoon that was put together by Dr. Ramaswamy Swami and Dr. Pelig in my department, looking at a younger person and an older person. And what you see here are physiologic reserves. And in a younger person, you can see there are lots of physiologic reserves. But as you get older, you are using these physiologic reserves to do your everyday activities, okay? And so you have much less available. And so when stress comes and illness comes, trauma comes, the younger person has a lot to be able to work with, whereas the older person doesn't. And that leads to bad outcomes. What kind of bad outcomes? Some of the things we were just talking about, iatrogenic complications are more common, social withdrawal, and death but also, and this is a take home, post-op outcomes. So increased complications, loss of functional status, prolonged recovery, increased uh, mortality. So we have been taught to do uh, pre-op consultations on our patients. And we have all of these different, um, I don't even know what people are using anymore <laughs> for, for the uh, risk factor analyses, all right? But this, I apologize for the slide, but this uses some, some that we used, probably still using, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, yeah. And then the Lee and Engel risk indices, which were mainly for cardiovascular uh, disease. What you can see for all of these is that using the index alone, this is the area under the curve for post-op complications. Adding in frailty increases the area under the curve significantly. So it's really important to think about, is this person frail when you're making your recommendations and what you might be able to do? So I'm going to talk about a couple of frailty measures. Frailty measures attempt to quantify physiologic compromise. They are rough to do without some uh, help. So Freed's phenotypic frailty, I will show you. That's Linda Freed, who is the uh, dean at Mailman the Rockland deficit accumulation, and the frail scale, which actually sits in our epic. So phenotypic frailty has five components. An unintentional weight loss of 10 or more pounds over the last year. Weakness in grip strength. They use dynam dynamometers. I never said that word right. Exhaustion, self-report that everything is an effort. They could not get going for three or more days last week. Walking speed, gait speed is in the lowest 20%. And they're couch potatoes. They don't move around much. And the scoring, if you have zero to one of these, you're considered robust. If you have two to three, you're considered vulnerable or pre-frail. That's Isaiah. Four to five, you're considered frail. Okay? And you have increased length of stay, increased death, increased complications. The second is called the deficit accumulation method. And this is really looking at a number of things and counting up how many deficits you have, all right? And I'm going to show you one from England. You'll know that by the spelling. And these are the medical diseases. No surprise there, right? The usual candidates. And then there are the geriatric syndromes that we just talked about, which by themselves give you even more of a deficit. And then there's what they call social deficits that somebody's housebound, activity limitation, social vulnerability, and a requirement for care. 
All right. And then this is what we have in Epic. And during the past four weeks, have you felt tired all or most of the time? I know most of the residents can say yes to that. Do you have any difficulty climbing 10 steps alone without resting or using an aid? Do you have any difficulty walking one block alone without using a cane or a walker? Do you have five or more of these illnesses? And have you unintentionally lost 5% or more of your body weight in the last six months? And here's the scoring, very similar to what we saw before. So there is a way for you to ask these questions of your patients and get a sense if they're frail. So when we were talking about what your life is going to be like, we mentioned frailty, but remember, it's only a quarter of people who are 85 and older. But you do need to identify who they are. And there are real upsides to aging, all right? So you're less insecure. I can, I can tell you that. <laughs> You say and do what you want. I've been here 26 years. I, my guess is that most people, Andy, would say that I say and do what I want, but it's gotten even more so <laughs> as I've gotten older. You're more likely to see the big picture of what's going on. You recognize that time is limited, so there's a greater focus on the present and what's really important. And you have more emotional control because of that. It's not saying that older people don't have road rage, don't get really angry, but they do it less often and it lasts a shorter amount of time. And that's because, believe it or not, as you get older, you learn things. You learn how to cope with things. You learn how to problem solve. You have increased wisdom. So there are some real upsides to aging. So let me finish up with talking about what can we do as doctors to help patients and their loved ones keep their eyes on the prize no matter what their biologic age. And to me, the prize is an enjoyable, engaged, and meaningful old age. So the first thing is avoid frailty. There is a cycle of frailty that we really want people to stay away from. As you get older, you start to lose muscle mass. I hate to tell you this, but this starts in your 30s, okay? And you keep losing muscle mass. And sarcopenia, for the Latin scholars in the room, okay, sarco is muscle, penia, penia is too little, too little muscle, is much less muscle than you would expect for somebody of that age. So how do you get from here to here? Inactivity, people who have acute illness like the ones you're taking care of in the hospital, undernutrition, obesity, certain chronic diseases, and certain medications. What happens when this happens? You have decreased strength, decreased exercise tolerance, increased exhaustion. You don't move as much. You don't walk as much. You don't do as much. And the cycle keeps going. So we really need to intervene and intervene in our hospitalized patients as well, because they get really deconditioned, and you all know that. The second thing to do, encourage positive perspectives on aging. You as doctors have a real chance to help somebody feel better about themselves, OK? And I mean, I tell a number of my patients, and I mean it, that they're my role models, that I would love to have an older age like they have, OK? Mike is one of them. So those of you who may remember Jackie Gleason, or the honeymooners, okay, that's uh, um, Ralph Cramden, that's the picture, but the patient was Mike. And Mike had 50 something years of marriage to a woman, he was a bus driver, he was a, a mailman, and he nursed his wife during the end of a uh, terrible disease. I met him when he was about 85 and he came in, he said to me, life began at 80. I said, oh, yeah? He said, yeah. I said, why? He said, I got on Match.com. I met this woman. She's a writer. She's an author. She travels the world. It has been great. I'm writing plays. I'm going to all these things with her. She, I, she was also my patient. She died about seven years later. But two years later, Mike comes in, back on Match.com. There was Midge, OK? <laughs> And he was living half time with Midge and half time with his daughter at this point. All right. Um, he has had more stents than probably anybody in this hospital. And <laughs> he just keeps going. Most recently, he's now 95. He moved out to California to be with his son and live in an assisted living. And the women in assisted living are having a good time with Mike. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it, it, it is what you make of it. All right. 
Another thing to really help your patients with is adapting to your old age. Things are gonna change. They're not gonna be what they were when you were younger, okay? So does anybody know who this woman is? You probably know her name, Grandma Moses, okay? So she was a painter. Um, she started painting at 76. The reason she started painting at 76 is that her arthritis got so bad she couldn't embroider anymore. And she painted every day until she died at 101, okay? Help people to think about what matters to them and how they can get the same pleasure doing something else, how they can adapt. We need to help ourselves and our patients reframe the idea of independence. You know, this is America, autonomy, freedom, self-reliance, right? And if you're not independent, you're dependent and that's bad. So how about interdependence? That you don't need to do everything independently that you use those things and people that you need to, to be able to do what's most important to you. If you want to go to a concert at eight o'clock that's at Lincoln Center, you take a nap in the afternoon. You get somebody to drive you there, or you get a car, or you have an aid. You do whatever it is, and you can't hear that well, so you got hearing aids, so you can hear and participate, okay? It's not that you're dependent. You're making yourself more independent. So finishing up with the geriatric five Ms, we have multi-complexity, which is the whole person. This is what you need to think about when you're making a plan for older people. How do you put it all together so that you maximize their mind, their mentation, their mood, their mobility, which is very important to them, their medications, so they're not taking too many, but they're taking what they need to be taking. And most importantly, that you know what matters most to them. Because that's really what their medical care is in service of. It's not in service of a hemoglobin A1C, okay? I can guarantee you. It's to let them be with people, have conversations, do their art, whatever it is that matters to them. So I'll end with tips on being a better doctor for your patients. The first is resist ageism wherever you see it in our offices, on the street. It's not uncommon for people to say to an older patient, you're so cute, I wanna take you home with me. I have to say, when you walk, in, and, and people are trying to be nice, I know that, but when you walk into the doctor's office, it's like the last thing you wanna hear. You're worried, you've got things you wanna talk about, okay? And you feel like you're being kinda of pushed off, you're infantilized. Prescribe socialization and engagement. Get people outside, get them into the sun, tell them, Find a group that does things that they like to do. The, the pandemic taught us about loneliness. It taught us that it's as bad a risk factor as smoking cigarettes, okay? This is public health, we need to do this. Help your patients right size their expectations. They are not gonna be able to do everything they could do when they were 20, okay? A friend of mine's father was a Marine, he went back at 75 to the gym, he was ready to quit after three days, okay? <laughs> He expected to be able to do everything he could do at 20. And I said to him, you know, the Boston Marathon has a 20-year-old group and it has an 80-year-old group. And there's a winner of the 20-year-old group and of the 80-year-old group. But the time difference is considerable in terms of hours, okay? But that 80-year-old is in the best shape any 80-year-old could be. That can be you. So we need to get people to realize that it's, yes, you lose things, but you gain things as well. Every time you see your patient, look at that medication list. Do they need this medication? Are they still taking it? Did somebody tell them 100 years ago, you should take this for life and so they're still taking it? I have a six month rule. When somebody reviews, refuses a suggestion that I make, within six months, generally, they'll say yes, okay? Whether it's a hearing aid or an aid or a cane, okay? You just keep talking to them about it. And eventually they get it, that it's gonna make their life better, all right? I mean, all of you have things in your ears, right? <laughs> Doesn't make you look older. Teach your patients to advocate for themselves and encourage them to let others advocate for them as well, particularly in healthcare. This system is so broken. Anybody who can help, and if you are a medical student and you have time to be able to sit and really help someone with this, that's a, a, that's a wonderful thing. Laugh more, don't be so serious. You and your patients, okay, it's good for you. 
and be a doctor who knows the difference between caring for 80 year olds and 60 year olds. So these are the objectives I hope that you're walking away with, that how a person reacts to aging determines what their old age will be like, that 80 year olds and 60 year olds are not the same, and you can formulate your care plans based on biologic, not chronologic age, age related changes, and the five M's, what really matters. So who are you in old age? I'll end with this. This is a picture I got off the internet. I've never been able to get permission to use it because I can't find out where it came from. But <laughs> it's the same guy four times in life, right? Here he's like in junior high, here he's after college, here he's midlife, and here he's old. He looks in the mirror, he sees all of this inside him, okay? You look when you meet him and you see this. Remember, all of this is there, or as Gertrude Stein says, we're always the same age inside. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Leslie. Got a great, uh, wonderful talk. Uh, we have some questions on Zoom. Uh, so, one question is uh, Do you think GLP 1s add to frailty? Do I think GLP 1s add to frailty? I don't think we know. I can't answer that. I don't think we know. You know, if we're giving them and they're accomplishing what they're supposed to accomplish, I don't think so, but I don't know. I guess one question, that just your general thought from a lot of the investment and anti-aging research, a lot of billionaires are in that space. <laughs> what are your general thoughts on those initiatives? So it depends on what you mean by anti-aging. There is a book that's number one on the bestseller list right now called Outlive that actually is written by a surgeon and is very thoughtful about how people your ages should live your lives so that you have the longest healthy, health, what's the word? Health, yeah, healthy aging, but that you're healthy the longest amount of time, okay? And sick the least amount of time. So that I think is ideal. And if you can do that, that's wonderful. But I think it's outrageous to have, and I'll, I'll just put it out there, to have older people thinking that they should be living to be 100, 200, 300 years old, okay? I mean, the world needs to change. It needs to turn. <laughs> there needs to be space for people to, you know, to grow up and to have a life. And it's not gonna happen if we have all these people, even if they're active and involved, it's not, the, the earth is not gonna be able to take it. So I, I am against that. <laughs> So on the inpatient side, probably the one thing we do to promote, you know, health for, you know, for older folks is that we improve focus on mobility. And the hospital has invested some resources. It's focused on people who are not walking, not so much on age. Are the things you recommend for our old folks in the hospital that, or that our geriatric service does to promote healthy, you know, time? Around? Yeah. So a couple of things that I suggest number one is don't give anybody a two gram sodium diet unless they absolutely need a two gram sodium diet, okay? And heart healthy is two gram, right? Yeah, okay. Taste that food. <laughs> you are catabolic when you're in the hospital. <laughs> you need to eat as much as possible. Make it at least palatable for people to be able to do that. Get people out of bed. They may not be able to walk around, but gravity is your friend. Your PO2 will increase simply by sitting, okay? So it's really important to do that. When you make rounds, don't ask yes, no questions all the time. Find out what's going on in that brain because delirium is far more common than a change in heart rhythm in the hospital and older adults. And you wanna pick it up because it tells you that there's something happening medically and you can pick it up early. So those are things that you can do that I think would make a difference for our hospitalized patients. Again, thanks again, Dr. Lester. Very illuminating. Thank you. My pleasure.